SN2 reactions. That's going to be the topic in this first lesson in a chapter devoted towards substitution and elimination reactions. And after we deal with SN2 reactions in this lesson, we'll move on to SN1 reactions and compare and contrast the two. And then we'll move on to elimination reactions and do the same. Now, we'll start off in this lesson by talking about the mechanism of the SN2 reaction. We commonly refer to that as backside attack. And we'll then talk about the rate law and the kinetics. And then we'll uh, review a variety of factors that affect the outcome of an SN2 reaction. We'll look at substrate effects, nucleophile effects, solvent effects, and leaving group effects. Uh, we'll do the same thing with SN1, and then we'll compare and contrast the two uh, in the subsequent lesson so we can look at how to predict products when we got SN1 and SN2 on the table. Now this lesson is part of my new organic chemistry playlist, and I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications, you'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so before we dive in, uh, we definitely just got to take a little time to talk about what does a substitution reaction even look like, and who are the players we'll talk about here. So uh, these are called nucleophilic substitution, So, and we'll be uh, the thing doing the replacing, the thing doing the substituting will be called a nucleophile here in blue. And what it will be replacing here, I've got abbreviated LG for leaving group. So, and the reactant with the leaving group is often either called the electrophile, since it's reacting with a nucleophile, or more commonly the substrate, which is the term I will use here. And so we can see here in our substrate, our nucleophile reacts with our substrate, replacing the leaving group, and now the leaving group's been kicked off and is all alone. Now, turns out to be a nucleophile, your big hallmark to be a nucleophile is going to be a lone pair of electrons. Now, uh, that's a really vague definition, and once we get into SN2 and SN1 specifically, we'll get a little better idea of what these nucleophiles look like. Uh, and then your leaving group, the big thing is that your leaving group needs to be stable on its own after it leaves. Uh, and the, the larger halides, chloride, bromide, iodide, are the most common leaving groups by far, but we'll see a couple others along the way as well. Let's take a closer look at SN2 reactions. So the first substitution reaction we'll talk about is SN2, and SN2 stands for Substitution Nucleophilic Bimolecular. And the bimolecular term is really a kinetics term. It refers to the fact that there's two reactant molecules involved in the rate determining step, the slow step of the reaction. In SN2's case, that's usually the only step in the reaction we'll find out. Uh, and in this case, because those two molecules are both involved in that rate determining step, they typically both show up in the rate law. So we took a typical rate law here for an SN2 reaction. We see that both the nucleophile and the substrate show up. First order with respect to the nucleophile, first order with respect to the substrate. Those are the exponents, if you might recall, from Gen Chem. So when there's no exponent written, it's implied that it's a one, and the overall reactant, I'm sorry, the overall reaction order is just those individual orders added together. So first order for the nucleophile, first order for the substrate, second order overall that's where that two again comes from. Bimolecular rate laws always are second order rate laws. All right, so keep in mind that two does not refer to the number of steps in the reaction. So, because most SN2 reactions are a single step, we'll find out. But it does refer to how many reactant molecules are involved in the rate determining step. All right, so we take a closer look at an example here. So here I've got uh, two bromobutane reacting with sodium cyanide and acetone. Uh, and in this case, two bromobutane is our substrate. Let's write that out. So bromide is a good leaving group, it turns out. So we stated that a little bit earlier, and the idea is that, you know, you learned in Gen Chem, HBr is a strong acid, so Br minus, the conjugate base, is a super, super, super weak conjugate base, and that's the hallmark of a good leaving group. I want it to be really stable after it leaves, and an indication that it's really stable is that it's a really weak base. All right, so in this case, it turns out the hallmark of the mechanism for SN2 is called backside attack. I wrote it because it was worth writing. When you think of SN2, the first thing I want to come to your mind is backside attack. Uh, most important thing. In fact, we'll use that kind of idea to kind of determine some of the different substrate effects and nucleophile effects and things of this sort that are all related to SN2 reactions. So keep that in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a second, but first and foremost, that's the first thing I want to pop in your mind when you think of an SN2 reaction. All right, so here we've got sodium cyanide. You should realize that sodium's a metal, carbon's a non-metal, and so that's an ionic bond. So being an ionic bond, whether they write it or not, we should have positive and negative charges. So here we've got a sodium cation and the cyanide anion. And we'll find out that having an anion for your nucleophile, so it turns out cyanide here is our nucleophile. So, and having an anion for a nucleophile generally means it's going to be a strong nucleophile. So, 
And what's going to happen here is that cyanide here is going to do nucleophilic attack, and it's the backside attack. The nucleus is doing backside attack. And what we mean by backside attack is that it's attacking 180 degrees opposite from where the leaving group is leaving. So here, 180 degrees opposite from where that bromine's going away. We'll talk a little more about that in a bit here. So, but when we attack there, so that carbon's already got a filled octet. And already having a filled octet, we're going to make a new bond. So when we say nucleophilic attack, you should think nucleophilic attach. So we're attaching a new bond here. Well, this carbon's already got four bonds. There's a hydrogen not shown. So if we're going to make a new bond, we have to have an old one leave. And that's why our leaving group here is going to break off and leave. Now we'll find out that one of the products of our backside attack is what we call inversion of configuration. And so in this case, uh, showing inversion is a little bit of a problematic thing here. So, but one of the things we can do is it, you know, oftentimes we'll, we'll draw it in such a way that your leaving group's either on the wedge or the dash, and then just attach your nucleophile in the opposite position. It's kind of one of the easiest ways uh, to kind of represent inversion, although it's not a very literal way of looking at what inversion actually is. So but we'll keep that in mind. All right, so in this case, again, if we look at our rate law, the nucleophile shows up here in our rate law. And so whether we wanted to call that, you know, sodium cyanide or just plain cyanide, I'll put the entire thing. So you could just put cyanide there. And then our substrate, which in this case is the 2-bromobutane. And there's our rate law. And so some typical questions you might get. So first one is, what would happen to the rate of this reaction if you doubled the concentration of sodium cyanide? Well, here I can see that the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of sodium cyanide. So if you double the concentration of sodium cyanide, you double the rate. Second question, what would happen if I double the concentration of 2-bromobutane? And once again, the rate's directly proportional to the concentration of your substrate. So if you double the concentration of 2-bromobutane, you'll double the rate. Finally, you get what happens to the rate if you double both concentrations. And so if we double the concentration of sodium cyanide and double the concentration of 2-bromobutane here, then the rate's going to go up by a factor of 4, because 2 times 2 is 4. Doubling, doubling, 2 times 2, quadrupling for that rate. Cool, now acetone is our solvent here, and the tricky question you might get in regard to this rate law is what would happen if I just doubled the amount of acetone used, but kept the number of moles of sodium cyanide and 2-bromobutane the same constant? Cool, and it looks like, well, acetone doesn't show up in the rate law, Chad, so obviously it's not gonna have an effect. And that's the tricky answer that is wrong. So in this case, these brackets mean concentration. It's moles of each of these species divided by the liters of solution. And if you just doubled the amount of solvent, but kept the number of moles of these constant, you just cut their volumes in half. You just diluted them in half. And so in this case, if we double the amount of solvent, acetone, but leave the number of moles of sodium cyanide and 2-bromobutate constant, their concentrations are both cut in half, and a half times a half, the rate would now be one-fourth of that rate you just had a second ago. So be careful. So if you change the amount of solvent, so but keep the moles of, of the other reactants the same, it actually is going to impact your rate law. Okay, so I want to take a little bit closer look at backside attack for just a minute. So if we take a look at this from a different perspective here, so we're going to take a look at bromine right here, and then we're going to have three different groups attached like so. So backside attack in this regard has cyanide coming right in between these three groups. So right in between those three groups, and that's going to cause bromine to break off and leave. Now, cool. So first off, cyanide's job, he has to squeeze in between these three groups. And notice these are kind of like the three legs of a tripod, and he's got to squeeze in there. And if he does, he's going to form a new bond to that carbon, but to keep being sp3 hybridized and tetrahedral in shape. So these three groups have to kind of flip to the other side. And so what we'd end up with as a product So it would be this, and these three groups kind of just flip off to the other side after bromide leaves. So you might think of an umbrella flipping inside out is what's really happening. Now this is kind of a pain in the butt to represent and stuff like this. So again, what we normally do to represent this inversion taking place is again, if your leaving group leaves from the wedge, we'll just replace the new nucleophile there as a dash or vice versa. That's kind of the easiest way rather than trying to reflect the fact that there's this inversion and you kind of have this umbrella flipped inside out and things of this sort. So that's a pain in the butt. One other thing you should know though, is that sometimes, we have, you 
represent the transition state. And that double dagger there means transition state. So in fact, I'm probably going to need a little more room for this transition state. And so in this case, we're forming a new bond from cyanide to this central carbon right here. So we've got the old bond to bromine breaking. We've got this bond right here. And then we've got the wedge and the dash bond. And so for just a brief minute, so the reactant here is tetrahedral. The product is also going to be tetrahedral. But in the transition state, the relationship of these three groups right here, again, these three groups right here, for just a brief instant, they are trigonal planar and 120 degrees apart. So again, they're going to start off all 109.5 degrees apart. And in the final product, they're going to all be 109.5 degree apart, but inverted. But in the transition state, it's trigonal planar. The angles between these three are all 120 degrees. And that's a good characteristic that you should know for an SN2 reaction. That transition state is trigonal planar. Reactant tetrahedral, product tetrahedral, sp3 hybridized in both cases, but the transition state, not the intermediate, but the transition state is trigonal planar. All right, one other thing I should mention real quick. So we've got two, so two different uh, major mechanistic steps occurring here. So the one in red here represents nucleophilic attack. The one in, I'm sorry, one in blue here represents nucleophilic attack. The one in red, the leaving group leaving. And because they both happen at the same time, so two different mechanistic steps occurring all at the same time, we say that the mechanism here is concerted all happening at the same time. That's all that word means, concerted. So for SN2, it's concerted. And the reason that's so important is we'll find out that for SN1, these will happen in two different steps and it won't be a concerted mechanism. But an SN2 reaction, the mechanism is concerted and this all happens in a single step. And so if we take a look here, so I'm plot the energy versus kind of the reaction progress or the reaction coordinate, some people will say. So you'll find that this all occurs in a single step. And so in this case with a single here, uh, a single hill, I should say, and I'm not too concerned if you recognize that this should be an exothermic reaction or anything like that at this point, but you should recognize that one step, one hill, that's it. Cool. All right, so let's take a look at some substrate effects for just a second. So, and let's take a look at this guy once one more time, a little bit bigger. So again, we've got our nucleophile. In this case, I'll just generically write nucleophile. And he's got to squeeze in to do backside attack. Now he's got to fit in between these three atoms right here. And the bigger he is, the harder time he's going to have. And so it turns out uh, how strong a nucleophile is, is definitely related to its own size. Smaller nucleophiles tend to be, uh, have a little easier time squeezing in here. Bulkier ones, a little harder time. Now polarizability plays a, well, a result as well. So it turns out if a nucleophile is polarizable, like if it can, you know, kind of squeeze and sh change the shape of its new uh, electron cloud, it can also have an easier time squeezing in here as well. So, but right now I just wanna really focus on bulkiness. So if you got something fairly bulky, so probably not gonna be the greatest nucleophile in the world. Uh, cool, also your substrate's gonna play a role here because how big the three groups attached in these three locations are also plays a role. The bigger they are, the slower this SN2 reaction's gonna go. The smaller they are, the faster it's gonna go. And so if we take a look, what could these three things be? Well, the best we could have for an SN2 reaction is that they're all three going to be hydrogens. This is just simply methyl bromide. So that's the smallest atoms you could have attached here. So, and in this case, for an SN2 reaction, that's the best kind of substrate you can have. So if we take a look at substrate effects here for a minute, so we say that methyl halides are the most reactive. Methyl halides, the most reactive. Now, if we take and replace one of these hydrogens with some sort of carbon chain, whether it be a methyl and ethyl propyl, it's not the most important thing, but any one of those. So let's say I take this top one and I now make it a methyl group. Well, all of a sudden now this is not just simply methyl bromide, so, but it is a now a primary alkyl bromide. So the carbon attached to the bromine, often called the alpha carbon, where the functional group is, in this case, the alkyl halide, that alpha carbon is now a primary carbon. So with a primary carbon right there, it actually is still pretty darn fast. Most nucleophiles can still have an easy time squeezing in here to do backside attack. And so primary halide is still really reactive in SN2 reactions, not as fast as methyl, but still pretty darn fast. Cool, now let's replace yet another one of these 
with another carbon chain, and it could be a methyl, an ethyl, propyl, whatever. So, but now this alpha carbon is no longer primary, it's secondary. And it turns out that this actually is gonna slow down the reaction significantly. Most secondary halides react in SN2 reactions pretty slowly. They still react, but it's much more, uh, much slower than our primary halides. Cool, and then finally, if you change this last hydrogen for any kind of carbon chain, again, another methyl, for example, all of a sudden, now we have a tertiary halide, and it turns out for a tertiary halide, the reaction's so slow that we really kind of just say it's non-existent. Whether or not that is really just so slow, so, but for the most part, you're just gonna treat it in your class as that it is non-existent, that this doesn't react. Tertiary halides don't do SN2. We like to say that backside attack is completely blocked. There's no nucleophiles that can now fit in to do backside attack. So these are our substrate effects. So methyl halides are the most reactive, then primary, then secondary, and then tertiaries don't work. Cool, and as long as you remember that we're doing backside attack for SN2, then you want the least amount of steric hindrance on your substrate possible. And that again is gonna happen for methyl, then primary, then secondary. Now one other thing you should be aware of when it comes to substrate effects, Cool. So let's say I want to do backside attack on either one of these. Well, they're identical right now. So right now they are both, if we look at that alpha carbon right there, primary. And obviously it's the same molecule, so it shouldn't make a difference. But if I go off to that beta carbon now, so oftentimes we give Greek letters and where the functional group is, in this case, the alkyl halide, that's the alpha carbon, and then you just go beta, gamma, delta, so on and so forth. And so in this case, if we take a look at those beta carbons, it turns off they can have an impact on how fast SN2 happens as well, but to a lesser degree most of the time. So most of the time we're just gonna examine the alpha carbon and, and just kind of go methyl's the fastest, then primary, then secondary, tertiaries don't react. However, if you do have to compare two different primary alkyl halides, well then the difference might actually end up coming to that beta carbon. And if we look here, here the beta carbon is a secondary carbon, here that beta carbon is a quaternary carbon. And it turns out this one right here, even though it's a primary alkyl halide, we said before that primaries actually react pretty fast. Well, this one doesn't. It turns out we call this beta blocking or beta branching is probably a more proper term, but you'll hear both. So in this beta branching, the more substituted that beta carbon is, the slower it goes as well. And so again, this is of secondary importance here. So that alpha carbon is the most important thing by far. But every once in a while, you get a question like this thrown in there, where the only difference really comes down to the beta carbon on the substrate. Which one's more substituted? This one. Then it's going to be slower. And this one faster. In fact, this is so slow, it's kind of comparable to tertiary, as it turns out. Uh, not something you necessarily have to supposed to know, but again, you should know this principle of beta branching. Much less commonly tested upon, but does show up uh, every once in a while. All right, now that we've talked about substrate effects, next thing on the list is talk about nucleophile effects. So it turns out your nucleophile is in your rate law. It is reacting in the only step of typically most SN2 reactions, which makes it the rate determining step. Uh, and it turns out, therefore, you need a strong nucleophile. And so the question then becomes, well, how do I recognize what a strong nucleophile is? So, well, one major thing is most of the time your strong nucleophiles are going to have a negative charge. They're going to be anions. So if we kind of got a list over here of all your strong nucleophiles, we got cyanide, azide, chloride, bromide, iodide. So a couple with sulfur with a negative charge, a couple with oxygen with a negative charge. So, but there are a handful. So it turns out sulfur is an amazing nucleophile. And even when it doesn't have a negative charge, when it's neutral, it's still an amazing nucleophile, it turns out. Not as good as when it has a negative charge, but still considered a strong nucleophile. Also, nitrogen and phosphorus, also strong nucleophiles, or at least moderately strong, with uh, no negative charge when they're neutral as well. So, but most of the time though, you won't, you're not gonna see these all that often with uh, uh, the sulfurs, the phosphorus, the nitrogen with no negative charge. Most of the time, the strong nucleophiles you're gonna see in this chapter are gonna have a negative charge. And you're gonna find out that's gonna be the key hallmark. All of your weak nucleophiles we'll find out and talk about later on in this chapter are gonna have no negative charge. They're gonna be neutral. And so this will be one of the major determining factors uh, we'll find out later. So it turns out a couple things we should realize. Uh, we'll get into solvents here a little bit at the same time. There's two major types of solvents we're gonna use in this section. We call them polar protic solvents and polar aprotic solvents. Now, nonpolar solvents, we're 
pretty much not going to use in this section, so I'll leave them out. And so when I write protic solvents and aprotic solvents, know that I'm referring to them as being polar in both cases. Now, protic refers to a solvent that is capable of hydrogen bonding. So in water and alcohols are the most common by far. And it turns out when we talk about protic solvents versus aprotic solvents, aprotic solvents aren't capable of hydrogen bonding, that how strong nucleophiles are changes. Now it turns out that protic solvents solvate ions very well. They form stronger ion dipole interactions with ions. And so in this case, if you were going to dissolve, you know, salt in a liquid, would you rather try and dissolve salt in water or salt in oil? Well, you'd choose water. So because water is polar and it's not just polar, it's protic, which kind of I like to think of in super polar. And the ion dipole interactions it forms with the ions is much stronger. And therefore, they're much likely to dissolve to form those ions. Whereas if you put salt in like oil, well, that's just going to sink to the bottom or float on the top, depending on the salt. And uh, it's not really going to dissolve to any significant extent because you're not forming ion dipole interactions with nonpolar molecules. Cool. So we got polar protic, polar aprotic, and if you want to solve eight ions, polar protic is your solvent. Problem though is that I need a strong nucleophile. Most strong nucleophiles have a negative charge, which means they're going to get solvated more by protic solvents. And what that means is they're going to form stronger ion dipole interactions, which is going to lower their energy. And so this protic solvents actually stabilize nucleophiles, making them less reactive. And so if I need a strong nucleophile for an SN2 reaction, then I'm going to do better if I do the reaction in an aprotic solvent. Cool. Now, if we look at aprotic solvents first, it turns out that nucleophile strength is going to increase as you get less electronegative. So it turns out, you know, having a negative charge, let's say. So if you're more electronegative, you're more stable having the negative charge, which makes you less reactive as a nucleophile. So less electronegative nucleophiles are more reactive. Well, that is never going to change, whether you're in a protic or an aprotic solvent. So less electronegative, as long as you're comparing, you know, atoms in the same group, they're going to be the stronger nucleophiles. So however, we're going to see the vertical trend here related to size is going to change. Now in an aprotic solvent, nucleophiles generally get stronger as you go up a group. Cool. And the idea um, is just that smaller nucleophile, in fact, this just follows the same as the base trend. Bases get stronger as they get smaller and as they get less electronegative as well. So exactly the same as the base trend. And you might think of a nucleophile as kind of analogous to a Lewis base. So not surprising that it follows the same trend. What is surprising though, is that when you go to protic solvents, the vertical part of this trend related to size changes. So, and it turns out in protic solvents, uh, it turns out all nucleophiles get weaker. All negatively charged nucleophiles, anyways, get weaker. So, however, the smallest nucleophiles, like these in, in period two here, they form the strongest ion dipole interactions with, say, water or an alcohol or any kind of protic solvent. And so they are stabilized the most. And so it turns out the big ions, they form much weaker ion dipole interactions, and so they're stabilized less. They're lowered in reactivity less. And so all of a sudden, when you go to protic solvents, the small ones see a huge decrease in reactivity, whereas the large nucleophiles see only a small decrease in reactivity, so much so that the vertical part of this trend is now different. And so in this case, it turns out that larger nucleophiles are stronger when the solvent is protic. Cool. Part of this is due to polarizability as well, but I'm not going to get into that too much. Um, but larger ions are more polarizable as well. All right, so now we kind of got into distinguishing these trends with nucleophiles and solvents and stuff like this. Uh, and the reason that's important is you might, uh, a lot of the questions in this chapter are going to be like comparing rates. And you might, you know, have two reactions that are, you know, exactly the same in every respect, except which nucleophiles involved. And so you've got to be able to compare nucleophiles, who's stronger, who's weaker, with one of these two trends. And again, most of the time for SN2, we'll see that we'll use aprotic solvents. And it turns out if you've got, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine nucleophiles, you pretty much got to use an aprotic solvent. However, for some of the bigger nucleophiles, you can get away, so period three and below, you can get away with using protic solvents. It would still be faster in an aprotic solvent, but you can get away with it at least uh, using protic solvents. But for the small period two nucleophiles, you pretty much got to use your aprotic solvent instead. All right, so here I, come, I got this big list of our strong nucleophiles. So, and kind of this is going to be one of the hallmarks of how we recognize whether or not we're doing SN1 or SN2, as we'll see later on when we compare this to SN1 reactions. Okay, so let's take a look at those solvents a little bit more closely here. And uh, typical protic solvents are going to be water, 
any kind of alcohol or in some cases carboxylic acids, though less common. But most of the time it's water and alcohols for protic solvents uh, that we'll see in this section. Whereas aprotic solvents, again, ones that are not capable of hydrogen bonding. So in many classes, you got to not only know the identities of a variety of aprotic solvents, but you got to know their structures as well. So in this case, the four most common polar aprotic solvents are acetone, dimethyl sulfoxide, aka DMSO, acetonitrile here, and then dimethylformamide, aka DMF. Cool, and these are the four most common. So you might also see like diethyl ether or THF, tetrahydrofuran, or HMPA is a little less common, but those are others that show up in di different textbooks with different professors. But these four are fairly universal. These are the four most common polar product solvents. Well worth your time to memorize these. Cool, most of the time again, you're gonna see these, it's gonna be associated with an SN2 reaction because SN2 reactions work better in polar aprotic solvents. And I say better, I mean faster in polar aprotic solvents. All right, last but not least, we gotta talk about leaving groups. And uh, the better the leaving group, the faster the reaction. So you'll find out that as far as the halides go, iodide is your best leaving group. Then, well, let's not skip bromide here. Then bromide, then chloride. And the idea is that iodide's a weaker base than bromide, and bromide's a weaker base than chloride. And again, you might remember this from Gen Chem, where HI was a stronger acid than HBr, and HBr was a stronger acid than HCl. If HI is the strongest of those acids, then I minus must be the weakest conjugate base. So, or you might just remember it from the trends that we learned just a second ago as well, and that larger bases are weaker bases. All right, so as far as the halides go, these are your good leaving groups. It turns out once you get to fluoride, HF is not a strong acid, and F minus really is a weak base, and it's not a very good leaving group. But these are all considered good leaving groups. Iodide is the best, though. So, and a couple others you might see something abbreviated OTS, it's called a tosylate ester. So, and there's a, a couple different tosylate esters, but he's the most common by far. And if you kind of take a look at what his structure looks like here. So it looks like this. So, and he's a super weak base, because in this case, the negative charge on oxygen, usually we associate a negative charge on oxygen as being a strong base, like on hydroxide, but not in this case, because it's stabilized with resonance. This negative charge is shared between all three of these oxygens. And so this guy's a fairly weak base, and you should recognize a structure like this uh, as a good leaving group. Cool, sometimes they'll just kind of generically write this with an R right here, because sometimes it's just a methyl group or a trifluoromethyl group or uh, things of this sort. But again, this one is what we abbreviate as OTS, which stands for a tosylate ester here in, instead. Cool, and sometimes they're just gonna give you a, a leaving group you've never seen before, and the thing they're looking for you to recognize is that, can you show that it's very stable and therefore a weak base and a good leaving group? Cool. Uh, but these are the most common leaving groups. One other thing to note, if you look at starting a substitution reaction with an alcohol, so not as your solvent in this case, but I'm saying, what if this guy were your substrate? Well, he wouldn't be the, a very good substrate for a substitution reaction here uh, because OH, if he leaves, is a very strong base. That's hydroxide. That's kind of like our standard Gen Chem definition of a strong base. Uh, so he would not be a good leaving group at all. And so finds out if you start with an alcohol instead of like an alkyl halide. So then one of the ways you can kind of convert this into a good leaving group is by protonating it. And so if you use something like, you know, say some sulfuric acid or something, some strong acid, you can protonate that alcohol. And so now instead of trying to have this leave as hydroxide, which is again, not a good leaving group, now it's gonna leave as water, which is a weak base and therefore a good leaving group. And so we'll find out that with alcohols, this is kind of a special case for substitution reactions. So is that in acid, they might do substitution. Without the acid here, substitution is not normally gonna happen. So when we get to the alcohol chapter in second semester, um, you might see some, some examples of this and stuff like this. But for now, so suffice to say, you have to treat alcohols kind of as a special case. They've gotta get protonated before this can leave. And then we'd add something else in here to be the nucleophile. And we'll find out we're pretty limited on what we might use for nucleophiles in, an, in a highly acidic solution here. So, uh, but alcohols have to get protonated to turn the OH into a good leaving group. And here again, leaving as water. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share, a couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems or the study guides that go with this lesson, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.